yes. in a special way. And thanks to Fidelity Active Trader Services, they all get power, price, service, no compromise. My name is Henry Peterson, although people have always called me Pete. I was born in Chicago, uh, October 21st, 1931. Went to public schools there and started uh, in college, and uh, that got kind of boring. Some of my friends were in the Army. They told me how much fun that uh, UCOM was, the European theater. So I decided to join. Unfortunately, UCOM was closed, so they said I could go to the Far East Command, and I joined. Okay, so uh, I took basic training in Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, started in November. And it was around January or February of 1950 that uh, shipped me over to uh, Sendai, uh, Japan, where I joined uh, the company. Since I had a little bit of college, uh, they made me the company uh, clerk of headquarters and headquarters company. Uh, that's, I did that for a few months and then I went into the INR platoon just before, this is probably in August of the year, we were at Mount Fuji on maneuvers and in September we went over uh, for the landing in Korea. Uh, 31st and the 32nd went into Seoul, they kept my regiment in reserve no. in Pusan. No, stop you for a second. Okay. Can you tell us, tell us what rank you were? Good, pick it up. Yeah, so I went into, uh, we followed up the 31st and the thir uh, 32nd regiments of the 1st Marine into uh, Seoul. Uh, we didn't see much fighting. I hardly remember anything there except seeing uh, a dead Marine. Uh, and, uh, well, I just, just don't remember much about that. There wasn't much action there. And they pulled us out because that was going very well. The, the uh, enemy, the Iming Gung they were called, North Koreans were in retreat, and so they swung us around uh, the coast to the other, uh, opposite the coast, the east coast to Iwan, and we landed there. We began our march up to the Manchurian border, which we got to the Yellow River in November, right around Thanksgiving. I know we were there at Thanksgiving, they dropped in a bunch of supplies to us. So about all the time that we were moving as a regimental combat team, we received fire from 360 degrees of the perimeter and uh, during our escapades we managed to pick up a lot of uh, extra stuff that wasn't in the TNO, or table of organization and because of that they had us do some things that weren't necessarily INR outlined in the manual I think like ambush and stuff like that uh, behind enemy lines. Okay. I'll get ahead of myself a little bit in terms of uh, semantics here, I guess. INR stands for Intelligence and Reconnaissance. And although we were supposed to only do reconnaissance, we picked up enough firepower that we had, they set us up one night to, for an ambush. It was a very interesting night. Uh, we didn't ambush anybody, but uh, <laughs> we were set up in a very precarious position because several thousand of the enemy is supposed to troop through this pass there and we were supposed to, to stop them if it came to that. But uh, I kind of digress there, but basically INR, intelligence, reconnaissance, our job was to establish contact with the enemy, find out where they were, their disposition, and quote, morale. I don't know, I didn't see any of them laughing, I don't know we're supposed to figure that out. But anyway, that was the assignment. Once we did that, we were free to uh, pull out as soon as we could. Sometimes it was easier than others. Okay, tell us about what, any story you can remember about the enemy contact as you were moving toward Heisen Jun? Uh, yeah, they, you know, there was, you know, a lot of bad stuff as you can imagine people getting killed and whatnot. There was also at least the one funny thing, and maybe you tend to, uh, uh, I think from what I read, it's, it's pretty much the same with everybody. You could spend a lot of time being absolutely terrified, and if you live through it, you start laughing like hell, like everything's funny, and, and uh, I guess that's some kind of relief, but uh, I do remember one thing that was very funny. Uh, when we would go on a patrol, the, the essence of a safe patrol is keeping your flankers out and your point man ahead of you. As long as you can do that, maintain contact, preferably visual, visually, but sometimes you have to do it by, by radio, 
you, you stand a good chance of not getting pinned down and, and massacred, which is what happened to a lot of the other INR platoons that I understand. But we, we did a good job of keeping our flankers out. And, and I remember one time watching a flanker, our flanker over the right move across the, the top of a hill. And he was at a distance, but I could see him, I could see what was coming. An enemy soldier with a sling arms was coming up the other side out of this hut. They met at the top of the hill, and both of them just peeled off in shock and went opposite ways. It was like a Max Sennett movie. Only our guy gathered himself together, ran back up to the top of the hill, got his rifle, and started to shoot. But in the meantime, this soldier, the, the North Korean soldier, had run down the hill and jumped on a donkey, it looked like, with another guy on it, and they went galloping off. It was just like something out of a movie. It was hysterical. Nobody Not, got killed. That was one time. <laughs> do you remember any names of the people that were in your platoon? Can you give us some? And, and tell us your, what you thought. What you thought of the guys in your yeah, platoon? Yeah, it's, like. it's ironic that uh, some guys uh, came and went, and uh, and uh, I think I remember a couple of them that got killed us, uh, uh, that uh, in a mine. And I talked to a friend of mine I'm still in contact with the other day, and he remembered that two of the jeep got uh, blown up. They had a landmine, and. Uh, uh, they were going back to a motor pool or somewhere, and uh, we weren't with them. I mean, there was this was supposedly uh, going back behind the lines, and it was supposed to be a safe thing. And those two guys I don't remember, but there were several that I do that made it for all the time I was over there, which is like through March, when I got hit and reprofiled myself. But there was a guy named Erlen J. Ballou, you remember these even initials? And he was from Florida. I looked on the internet. I'd like to see him sometime. A great guy. Ed Paul uh, was my squad leader. He was uh, a corporal. And a great guy who was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He put me in for a silver star. Uh, there was a guy named Gabby who did a lot of uh, talk. And, uh, he, you know, that's why I got that nickname. I'm not sure how much you could believe. He told me one time I threw a grenade in a bunch of guys that he saw an arm fly off. And, you know, I don't know uh, whether that uh, happened or not, but I, I did throw the grenade right in the middle of three guys that were coming of us, at us. One guy had a BAR, and I saw that much before I ducked back and got out of the way. Uh, there was a guy named Pat Ryan. I used to drink with, uh, with him over in the uh, enlisted club in Sendai. And he stands out in my memory for two reasons. Uh, one, he could eat a light bulb, and apparently that didn't bother him. And then when we made our retreat to Ham Hung, uh, he was a driver, so they sent all the drivers back down to the docks to load their vehicles on, and the rest of us stayed in the perimeter to protect the integrity of the unit. And uh, while I was down there, he and two other guys uh, drank uh, grapefruit juice cut with this alcohol. There's, I guess there's a wood alcohol that is okay with. There's another kind you use that's not okay. Well, they didn't know the difference. They had to, it's not okay. The other two died. He went blind for a while, but he survived and really came back to the, to the unit. So that's an, another fellow that I remember there. Uh, yeah, you know, people see the pictures of how cold uh, the snow and everything. I remember we were moving up by uh, down the road, a uh, road there in Korea, toward the front. Or we call it front, you know, up toward the lines where they were, and uh, north instead of west or east. Anyway, and uh, I, going by a Kamo truck, I heard the the Japan uh, the radio from uh, Japan. A crackling from the, the truck there, and he was saying, American troops are, are launching an offensive this morning in the coldest weather they've ever fought in. Oh, yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, I think it was like 27 below zero to my recollection. Uh, it was very, very cold, though. I know one thing. I slept many nights with the M1 in my, in a sleeping bag with the M1 sticking out, my hands out, uh, and I could lose that in one maybe and stay alive, but I wouldn't lose that sleeping bag. I'd be dead. That was, that was something I had to have. Even when we would go on patrol, 
I'd sit on the edge of the Jeep in the sleeping bag, with the M1 in my hand, if somebody shouted, just, the idea was I'd just fall forward and roll into the ditch. So it was very, very cold. And, uh, you know, other conditions. We swam in the Han River in September when we went over. And the next time uh, I had a bath was in December when I got on the uh, ship in the harbor there in Ham Hung. And uh, by that time, half the guys, we had gook hats on. Uh, we all had lice. Uh, you, know, you can imagine. The uh, last thing you worry about was little bugs. You're worried more about bullets. Tell us if you can recall what the reaction was when you hit the Yellow River, when you got to Heisenjen. Yeah, we got the Heisenjen. It was kind of weird. Uh, we just dug in there. The Chinese weren't in the war yet, so we'd look right across at them uh, with binoculars. And uh, yeah, strange. Uh, we, the uh, headquarters pulled up behind us and they set up tents, so we went back there and we could get some warm shower. We're used to eating sea rations, they hadn't had any hot meal in, in months. And uh, so it was kind of a strange experience because there are things that everybody's heard of, like Chosin Reservoir and Massacre Valley. Well, hell, Chosin Reservoir is 35 miles to the rear on our left flank, and uh, Massacre Valley was 65 miles to our rear on our right flank. The Chinese just bypassed this because if with a frontal assault, then they had to come across a river to machine gun emplacements. Now, that would have been a neat trick. I mean, maybe they could have done it with enough artillery. But anyway, they didn't try it. They did a smart thing. This one might buy us. We didn't even know about it. And then all hell blew, broke loose back there. But as far as we're concerned, I guess like most in, other infantrymen, all you know is what's going on right in front of you. You don't know about what's going on in the big picture. And then when finally, uh, it was, I have read what was going back on back then. I guess it was chaos. Uh, the rock uh, outfit was supposed to be protecting in front of the second division just fell away and didn't uh, support, give any retreating uh, uh, fire and or even notification of the second, so that's why they call it Massacre Valley. But when they finally got around to us, they said, you guys are still up there, uh, get out. Just, and so we started moving out and we got on everything that would move and started rolling. If it ran out of gas, it pulled in a ditch and that was it. One of the things that was interesting, I thought, that uh, what we did with, uh, with some of the Jeep so was to take a grenade, pull the pin, put a, car, a wrap of uh, friction tape around the grenade, and then stick it in the, in the gas tank underneath the seat. So that when they put the uh, gasoline in, after a while, that adhesive would wear loose, tape would come off, handle would come off, it would fall inside the gasoline underneath the driver's seat. So we weren't around, of course, when that surprise went off. But uh, there was huge road uh, building equipment pulled over, multi-million dollar stuff just pulled over on the side. Uh, as we were saying, the Chinese MPs are right behind us and they're not taking any prisoners. So we, we kept moving. Back in the States, uh, newspapers were reporting everything that was going on. Of course, when they, they, they showed all that fighting going to our rear, and the 17th being up on the Yellow River, they assumed we were wiped out. That was the understanding my folks had, is our unit had been totally wiped out. Well, that wasn't the case at all. As a matter of fact, since we, we were in the lead all the way up to Yalu, when we turned around, we were in the rear. So the other guys who were in the rear before, now in the front, they did all the fighting, the heavy fighting. I think the 31st practically got wiped out, uh, 32nd too. Yeah. Uh, and I understand it was opened up for us, the only, this is by hearsay, I wrote it back to my folks, that's the only reason I can recount this. I said the 187th opened up the way for us to, to come down and complete our retreat from the Yellow River. Just stop you for a second. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, as I said, a lot of bad stuff goes on over there, but there was some really highlights, some things that are nice to remember. Uh, I think I told you that funny story about the, the donkey and the guy running down the hill. One day we were up front, we were always out doing, on patrol, we were going through a village, and we were close, we knew, to where we thought there would be some contact. So I was in a window of this building looking out across this area toward a, a highway, 
uh, not a highway, but a road, uh, that somebody might come down in a vehicle, and I was covering it with uh, a machine gun, and uh, all of a sudden I heard some hollering and, 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 and saw some movement out there, and I took up binoculars and looked, and these guys were coming, they were white men, and I, I couldn't understand this. I thought, Jesus, it's, it, maybe it's Russians. Maybe the Russians got in the war. You get all kinds of rumor. I know the, or the Chinese might get into it. And uh, so anyway, when they got close enough, you know, I hollered out at them, and they started screaming, you know, we're Americans, we're Americans, we're Americans. And uh, so it was really nice. They had been captured by the uh, Imingong, and uh, they said they were treated well, but they were preached to constantly. Uh, about what bad guy uh, Harry Truman was and, uh, and somebody else, I, I forget who it was right now, but uh, they were trying to propagandize these guys and they let them go and this is a case they, they, they were really uh, treated well, and, uh, which is interesting because the stories I heard, and I don't know how much of this was true when we went over, is that uh, they had that death march with the 24th Division and they cut guys' fingers off, you know, to get the rings off, all kinds of war stories like that. Enough so that I believed it. There was one night we were on a night patrol and uh, we had to freeze out there. We were like in a, in a field and I don't know, it was a cornfield that seemed to reflect that, some kind of agricultural situation like that. I could, you could hear people going by, flipping by, lots of them on both sides. And I thought just a matter of time till they run right into us and and we have had because you know this was like a squad of squad patrol of eight or ten guys or something like that. And I knew I wasn't gonna have enough time to shoot anybody. I had a bayonet in, in one hand and a grenade in the other and I thought before they're taking me I'm taking this guy with me and he's going to pull a pin and we're both going out of here. So, you know, <laughs> it was a total reversal when those guys were, uh, were freed, uh, the stories I had heard. Now you told us before that somebody had put you in for Silver Star. Can you tell us about the incident or have you already told us about that incident? No. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, I uh, was put in an interesting thing. You, you hear about uh, courage and medals and so forth, and uh, it's interesting, my own, uh, my own take uh, on that and is, I've seen this tattoo, Death Before Dishonor, and I thought, you know, when I was a young man, I thought, boy, that's, that's pretty corny, and uh, I thought, you know, what is, what is this all about? Uh, what, uh, how can you feel that way about anything about not saving your life? And, but in Korea, I learned what that was all about. There was one day that we were on a patrol and we ran smack into a company, a platoon sized patrol. We were in the company, ran into a company. You know, and uh, I was out on a flanker and all of a sudden machine gun fire started coming. It was Burke gun. Guy was behind a fence, I couldn't see him. And my partner went down, ripped him right up the side, killed him. Uh, I jumped down in the ditch and then all hell broke loose. Uh, and that was a point, there was a fellow that was supposed to be manning the, the 50 caliber machine gun. He jumped down, was in the ditch, I turned around, his eyes were like bugged out of his head, they were like frozen, he was just paralyzed with fear. And I stood up and grabbed the 50 machine caliber machine gun and started shooting at some guys They were coming out of a tunnel way up on a hill, maybe 300 yards ahead. Uh, now this is why I was put in for the Silver Star. I stood there and stood up in the highway and shot at these guys. Big hero, right? No, wrong. If they got the high ground, we were all going to die. I just did what I had to do to save my butt. If my, my constitution was like the guy who was paralyzed with fear, I would have been paralyzed with fear. I'm just built differently. I'm not a hero. I just did what I had to do so we could get out of there. And uh, this is, I got a grenade at that point, got behind a jeep, ducked down, and three guys were coming out of a culvert there, and they were so close that I pulled a pin and bounced the grenade down into them. That's where this fellow Gabby I mentioned earlier, he said that the arm flew off. I don't know about that. Anyway, it took, it took them out of the picture. 
But in the meantime, back in this heroism thing, I'm thinking, let's get the hell out of here for Christ's sake. I mean, you know, there's 30 of us, there's a couple of hundred, God knows how many of them, but nobody's moving. But I'm in a position, I'm at the tail end of this thing, when I could have bucked out. And I'm thinking, well, if you guys are dumb enough to die here, I will too. Does that make sense? I don't know. I think, I think the serious part of it is that I'd probably rather be dead than uh, live with the idea that I bugged out. What, whatever happened to that silver star? That, that, that oh, well, that's, a, that's another story. Uh, Sergeant Ed Paul, the guy I, I really like. Sergeant Corporal, I forget what he did, made him sergeant. But uh, he was uh, my squad leader. He told me that uh, I had been put in for it, but the lieutenant, he put me in for it, this lieutenant, who was a platoon leader, killed it because on a patrol, uh, he wanted me to leave this kid who was floundering around uh, with a radio. He couldn't, he was too weak to carry the thing, the gun and all this thing, the little guy. And I kept stopping and helping. He was trying to keep the integrity of the squad, the squad together, keep us moving out. We're in no man's land. Uh, an IRR platoon from a battalion had been ambushed there the day before. That's what we were doing there. And he wanted to get the hell out of there. I could appreciate that. And so I gave him a, a finger salute or something like that. Uh, so. Oh, when we went over to uh, Korea, they uh, added some people to our uh, platoon. Uh, there were a few South Korean policemen, and they would accompany us uh, uh, on our trip over there uh, uh, to act as uh, interpreters. And there's at least one funny uh, situation there. When we were retreating from the uh, Yalu River, uh, they put our platoon out on a flank to, in a valley there to protect uh, the flank, the integrity of the column coming down. And they told us to like hold out to the last man. I told this platoon sergeant, that's me. He didn't laugh, I thought it was pretty funny. But anyway, uh, I'm out in the middle of this uh, rice paddy there in a hole in the ground, a foxhole, a machine gun, uh, pointing down up the valley there in case they came down. And our uh, South Korean interp uh, uh, interpreter had been interrogating some people over in this hut over there and along comes this guy down the valley and I pulled him over and, and told him uh, that the, the Koreans took him over to the uh, uh, shack there to interpret him, uh, interrogate him and uh, they wanted to find out if he was trying to infiltrate and he didn't tell them anything. Their idea of, of uh, interrogation was to clobber him with an M1 rifle, something like that, and worse. Uh, but anyway, he didn't give them anything. And they, they brought him back to me and told me to watch him. So I told the interpreter to tell him to get down in front of me uh, and put his hands behind his head. I figured this way, you know, if the Koreans shoot me at me, they're gonna hit him first. And uh, anyway, I could watch him too, right in front of me. And he started screaming and hollering. I couldn't figure what was going on. And uh, the interpreter took him back over to the hut and he came back later and said that he decided to talk because he thought I was going to kill him. I didn't touch him. But the, when I told him to put his hands behind his head and get down the ground, he's gonna, he thought he was going to get in the coup de grace, I guess. And he started chattering and he was an infiltrator. He told us where uh, the troops were, what unit it was, the whole thing. Which, again, yeah, pick up from that point. Yeah. Uh, so the interpreter uh, brought the, this fellow back over after they had him in a shack for a while and told me that he had revealed to them that he was with the Korean army and where they were and how many of them. Every, he answered all of their questions. The reason he had done it is because he thought I was going to kill him. Uh, when I told him to get down with his hands, he took the beating from them without telling them anything. When I said get down on your hands and knees, put your hands behind your head, he thought I was going to shoot him instead of just, you know, watch him. So he started chattering. Okay. It's, you've done great. Is there anything else you want to add or talk about that you feel you'd like to talk about? That's pretty much it. Unless there's anything in that... Uh, what? Let me just stop this one. Uh, well, note on, interesting note on a platoon leader. A uh, platoon leader we all went over with was with us a couple of months, and then uh, he got rotated out for one reason or another. We had a new uh, platoon leader uh, come in. And we had never carried grenades uh, un uh, until he came. And then he said, we're all going to carry grenades. And we thought, oh, baloney, you know, this is crazy. You know, we're an iron arm platoon. We're just uh, scouting around. We're just scouts. We're not supposed to get into anything heavy like that. 
Well, the first day we got him, we threw every damn grenade we had. That was the day that we got right in the middle of that, that uh, company, and which I thought we were never going to get out of there uh, 